We've been looking at the subject of spiritual discipline, and it's actually a good subject to be able to start the year with. We have looked at the purpose of spiritual discipline, and that's to be able to run the race that is set before us. We have to be disciplined in order to run the Christian race. It's important for us to be able to do and to obtain the goal. When an athlete goes and, and when an athlete goes and they do their sport, when a team plays, you know, when those football teams play, what do they play for? That Lombardi trophy, right? That's what they want. All the teams of the NFL want that Lombardi trophy. So they're going to discipline themselves so that they can do their best to get that Lombardi trophy. The field narrowed after the end of the day of who will get it this year. And only one team can get it in the end. We run as Christians, Bible says, for an incorruptible crown. A crown that fadeth not away. A crown that we can lay at the feet of Jesus when we go to see him there in eternity. And it takes a lot of discipline to get that crown. So the purpose of running the Christian race, the purpose of spiritual discipline, is to be able to run the race and have the strength and the ability to run the race and to receive the crown. And then there's the, we're probably going to plow some ground that we've been over before, but I, I've done that before, and it'll be good for us. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been here. The practice of spiritual discipline. In verse 25 there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25, First Corinthians chapter 9, there in verse number 25, the Bible tells us there, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That phrase there in verse number 25, striveth for the mastery, means to enter, to enter a contest to contend with adversaries. In our Christian race, there are going to be adversaries. People are going to oppose us in our Christian race. There are those that are going to put stumbling blocks in our way and pitfalls in our path that we will trip up on our Christian race and hopefully get so discouraged that we drop out of the Christian race. And although every Christian enters this race upon salvation, not all Christians continue the race. Many Christians quit because they don't want to participate in contending with the adversaries. I don't want to fight. I'm a lover, not a fighter. And the temptation is to transition from being a runner in the Christian race to merely observing other runners running the Christian race. To stay in the race, we have to be able to practice steadfast discipline. Have a plan, work the plan. In 1 Peter chapter 5, and verses 8 and 9, the Bible tells us of our adversary, the one who wants to derail us from running a Christian race. Familiar verses, I hope, to many here this evening. In 1 Peter chapter 5, and in verse number 8. 
Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he made the vower, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Know this, be assured of this, that the devil is not picking on you personally. You're not the only one he's picking on. He's picking on all of us. There are many others that go through the same afflictions and difficulties and troubles and trials that we do. We are not alone. Satan wants us to feel alone because that will get us discouraged. But there are other brothers and sisters in Christ who are going through the same sorts of trials that you're going through in your life. We are not alone in our fight. And that is actually a comforting thing to find, is that you're not alone in the fight. And you're not alone in the race. We have three ways in these verses that a Christian can implement the practice of spiritual discipline. And the first is found there in verse number 25. And that is to be temperate. In all things. As every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. The word temperate there means to be self controlled. Temperance is self control. As in the case of an athlete, for example, it means to set aside things that would harm the athlete in preparation for their athletic event. Now, besides the the winner of the Nathan's hot dog eating contest, if I'm going to run a race, I'm not going to pound down 94 hot dogs before the race. That's not going to help me in the race. It won't help me win the race. In fact, it will slow me down. Now, if I were a competitive eater, I would pound 94 hot dogs before the contest. (laughs) In training for that contest, those that are disciplined, they have to have the self-control that they need. You think about maybe going back years, some of you had possibly, possibly you did sports in school. There's a discipline there. There's practice. Practice. Not a game. Practice. Yes, there's practice. I didn't, I wasn't an athlete, but I sang in choir and, you know, in choir, you know, you have to practice. Before your concerts. And when I was a freshman, I was in the men's chorus group. That was the class that I had. And it was all boys, basically, whose voices hadn't changed yet. And when we would practice, the choir director, Mr. Long, would put us all around the piano. And he would bang out the notes to the song, and we would have to hit the notes of the song. And when he came to me to be able to do that, he would hit the note, and I would miss the note. He would say, too low. Hit the note again. Try it again. Too high. Hit the note again. Too low. No, you're just off. No, this, that. From that day to this day, I hate practice. (laughs) Even when it comes to singing and to choir, I don't like practice. But even though I don't like practice, I know it's valuable for a choir to have, for a group to have. Practice is important because they get to learn to sing together. They get to learn their part. They get to learn to harmonize with one another. And the more they practice, the better they become, usually. I know the value of practice, but I don't like it. 
at least when it comes to that. And because of that, I have to be able to practice temperance or self-control to be able to practice. If I didn't, I wouldn't practice. See, there ought to come a time in a Christian's life when they decide, I want something more, I want nothing more, excuse me, than the power of God on my life. I want nothing more than the knowledge of Christ, and I am willing to exercise temperance to gain these things. There are many who get up early in the morning. They're athletes, they lift right weights, they run to train for a marathon, and they even get up in the morning to go to class. Those people are crazy. <laughs> but to pursue higher education and advanced education, and they discipline themselves to do it. Now, I'm sure there are some mornings they don't want to get up to do these things, but they get up to do them anyway. Because if they don't, they won't make their goal of what they want to achieve. How about us as believers in Christ? Showing discipline and temperance. Cannot we exercise a similar temperance to be able to seek God's face in prayer and in Bible study? Being the first thing we do in the day. So our days go much better when we spend time with the Lord. In the beginning of the day. And I understand not everybody is a morning person. I'm not really either. But when my alarm goes off, even before my feet hit the floor, dear Father, I thank you so much for this day that you've given unto me. I may not be saying that out loud, but I'm thinking that in my brain. The discipline to do that. And the next thing I do is I read my Bible. After I've spent my time in prayer, I read my Bible. I'm spending time with the Lord. I'm speaking to the Lord. The Lord is speaking to me. Through his word and through his spirit. We live in what may be referred to as the Laodicean church age. You find that letter to the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14 and going down to the end of the chapter, verse number 22. And they were described there by the Lord Jesus Christ as a lukewarm people, lukewarm spiritually. It's not that they were against spiritual discipline. They just didn't want to practice spiritual discipline themselves. You can practice spiritual discipline. That's wonderful. For me, I don't want none of that. It's too much work. Well, many people in society are afraid of today, actually working. The average Christian knows more about sporting events than the messages they heard even this morning, let alone last Sunday. We need a generation today of Christians who will love the word of God, who will love their prayer closet, and they will love the things of God. So much that they're willing to discipline themselves to give up the things of the world for those things. But to feed that love, it demands being temperate 
in all things. This is the cost that many are not willing to pay. They're not willing to sacrifice things for better things. Because they don't realize that having spiritual discipline, having a love for the word of God and a love for the prayer closet and a love for the things of God and the love for his church and a love to tell people about Jesus, they don't realize that that's greater than what they have now. Do you realize that that's greater than what you have now? And then are you willing to sacrifice to make those things happen? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And a question you have to ask yourself every day. Consider once again the athlete. His training regimen is not determined by what he perceives as his rights or his feelings. He's willing to have a coach or to have a trainer to be able to get in his face and to tell him to dig deeper and to try harder and to do more. And he does it because he has a goal in mind. As Christians, we are to hold tightly when we hold tightly to our rights and our personal liberties. We give up something more valuable. We give up temperance. Sometimes we have to give up some of our personal freedoms and liberties as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to be temperate. Give up some of the things of the world that we enjoy to be temperate. It requires sacrifice. Many people are not willing to do that today. We notice we have gone from 50 to 30 in our attendance tonight. I figure there's around 30. I, I haven't counted everybody, but I figure there's around 30 here this evening. So there were folks that weren't willing to sacrifice about an hour, an hour and a half on their Sunday night to be here. I'm glad you did. And I hope you'll continue to do so. I understand it takes sacrifice sometimes to get here. I get that. In the midweek, it requires a sacrifice to get here. and may require some help to get here. But reach out and ask for the help. Be here. Because how are we going to learn, how are we going to gain spiritual discipline if we're not learning from the Word of God? And what better place is there to learn than here at church? Our habits and actions, they should be temperate. They should be disciplined. So we can run hard And so others will not stumble as they follow us in the Christian race. Not only do we run the Christian race, there are others that are following us in the Christian race. We have to make sure that they can run their race too. We have to make sure they have a clear course. Not to add to their stumbling blocks. Not to add to their pitfalls. In some cases, this even means setting aside things that may not be sinful that we do, but could be hurtful to other success. In the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 14, in verse number 
Romans chapter 14 and verse number 21. The Bible tells us there. It is good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine nor anything whereby my brother stumbleth, stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Temperate, being temperate in all things means abstaining from the distractions that would keep us from doing the work of God and being able to help our brother along the way. Not only do we find the practice of discipline is to be temperate in all things, but it's also to be purposeful in all things. So we read there in verse number 26, there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Bible says there, I therefore so run, not uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Paul was not practicing spiritual discipline for the sake of practicing spiritual discipline. He had a goal in mind. He had a purpose in mind. He was not running his race aimlessly. He was not running around in circles. He had a purpose. There was meaning behind everything the Apostle Paul did and every choice that the Apostle Paul made. And that reason comes to mind in the verses that are just before where we are at in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 19. The Apostle Paul gives us his purpose for exercising spiritual discipline. For though, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19, For though I be free from all men, Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I may gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. The purpose of the Apostle Paul's personal discipline was not only so that he could know Christ and have a relationship with Christ, but that he chose to live a life of discipline so others might know Christ. Paul wanted to live his life in such a way that anyone with whom he would come into contact with would be able to clearly see Christ in him. Should that not be our goal? When we come into people's presence, when we go to talk with people, they should know that we know Christ. Peter and John were that way when they stood before the Sanhedrin court. They knew that they had been with God. Should they not see that in us? Should that not be our purpose? And our goal. To know Christ. And to have others know Christ. Christ. Through us. That was the purpose behind practicing spiritual discipline. And we should practice spiritual discipline in our life so that we may know Christ and others may know Christ as well. And to be controlled by all things there in verse number 27. But I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. Lest by any means when I have preached to others I myself should be a castaway. The phrase there in the first part of verse 27. I keep under my body is a boxing term. It literally means 
To buffet one's body as a boxer is beaten black and blue. And, when God, and what God is teaching us here is that a disciplined life demands that our flesh be brought into subjection. It is controlled in all things. This will require probably some painful choices to make to be able to accomplish that. The Apostle Paul was testifying here in verse number 27 that he was willing to go through pain and reject particular comforts for the sake of having an effective life and testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was willing to give up the comforts of his life that others might know Christ, that he might know Christ. And to have an effective life and an effective witness and ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a tragedy beyond words when someone who has preached to others becomes a castaway. We have found that in the past. High-profile television evangelists back in the 1980s. Preacher has an affair with the church secretary. It's not a problem here. <laughs> My wife is the church secretary, so therefore I can have an affair with the church secretary. When a preacher embezzles money from the church. They become a castaway. They've lost their testimony. They've lost their effectiveness to preach the word of God and the gospel. They become disrespected. And not only does that affect them, it affects good churches like ours. Who are trying to live for the Lord and preach and teach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It gives us a black eye, too. The damage that is done to the cause of Christ can be immeasurable in these situations. But this doesn't just apply to those who stand behind a pulpit and preach on Sundays. If you are a Christian and people around you know it, and you are preaching or witnessing to others. If you're a Christian parent and you are witnessing and preaching to others, people are looking at your life. When we slip up, even though God may forgive us, there are some people who won't. That's just honest. That's the truth. And you may never win that person to the Lord Jesus Christ because of the lack of spiritual discipline. Paul didn't want to be a castaway. He didn't want there to be anything in his life that could potentially be a hindrance to someone knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. He was therefore willing to be controlled in all things. We should be as well. Because we should have a heart and a love for people who need to know Christ our neighbors, our friends, people we see around town, our family. And they're usually the hardest to win because they know where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> they can walk right to the closet and start bringing out the skeletons. Even of things that God has already forgiven us of, they'll still drag them out.
But sometimes it's not being able to tell these people about Christ. It's being able to show these people what Christ has done in your life. That takes spiritual discipline. Our Christian heritage has been carried through history by men who practiced spiritual discipline. And I'll have to end with this tonight. A man by the name of John Huss. He lived from 1369 to 1415. Maybe went to school with Brother Jerry, I don't know. He refused to recant. John Huss refused to recant of his position of salvation through Christ alone. Executioners undressed him, tied his hands behind his back, chained his neck to a stake. Wood and straw were piled up so that it covered him to his neck. Before the fire was lit, he was given one more chance to recant which he declined with the words, God is my witness, that I have never taught that of which I have been accused by false witnesses. In the truth of the gospel, which I have written, taught, and preached, I will die today with gladness. And he was burned at the stake. The great reformist Martin Luther, who lived from 1483 to 1546, when asked what his plans were, he replied, Work, work from early until late. In fact, I have so much work to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Martin Luther started most of his days with three to four hours in prayer every day. We're fortunate if we can do three or four minutes. It takes discipline to be able to pray. John Bunyan, the author of the book Pilgrim's Progress, who lived from 1628 to 1688, he was in prison 12 times for refusing to, to stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So not only did John Bunyan preach, he had a prison ministry. Each of these men and many others were men of spiritual discipline. They had devotion to what they believed in their lives and they determined that they would stand up for Jesus Christ no matter what. The consequences. Is it any wonder that God would use them to lead many to Christ in their generation? If you want to be used of Christ, you need to be able to practice spiritual discipline in your life. And that starts tomorrow or even tonight. By deciding, I'm going to lay aside some things in my life that I may have more time to pray, to read my Bible, to witness, to be an encouragement to others. We always have to remember and have to be reminded the things of this world, they're temporary. Having spiritual discipline brings about things that are eternal. And it's our choice whether we live for things that are temporary or things that are eternal. I appreciate your time and attention tonight. My time is done.